Good morning, everyone. In April 2016, I was diagnosed with stage 3 breast cancer. I felt like this would be a walk in the park and I would get through it with no issues and life would carry on as normal. But the closer the treatments got, the more fearful I became. I would love to say that I witnessed to other people and spoke to them about my faith, but I didn't. Most of the time I was in a room on my own and it suited me just fine. On the outside, I acted like nothing was wrong, but on the inside, I was feeling rubbish and just angry. Angry with myself, angry with life, angry with about the surgeries and angry with God. What I wanted to happen in between my treatments was draw closer to God, but instead, I withdrew and wasn't interested. The little confidence I did have was gone, and my low self-image was now non-existent. But in Ephesians 2 verse 10, it says, For we are God's masterpiece. He, was created, uh, he has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do good things he planned for us long ago. At some point during my journey of repenting and coming back to God, I read a devotional by Lisa Turkhurst, which I'd like to read a portion, a fair chunk really, of it to you. One day as I was reading Genesis chapter 2, I realized that out of all the ingredients in the world, God chose dust to breathe life into and create mankind. Immediately I wrote in my journal how much this encouraged my heart and helped me realize something different, something different about the circumstances of my life that seemed beyond repair and reduced to dust. I wrote, dust doesn't signify an end. It's often what must be present for new to begin. A few days later I shared with a friend about how when we place the dust of our life into God's hands and he mixes it with his living water, the clay that's formed can then be made into anything. She smiled so big because her mom is a professional potter. She'd seen clay being formed into many different things when placed into her mother's hands. And she shared something with me that made my jaw drop. She told me that wise potters not only know how to form beautiful things from clay, but they also know how important it is to add some of the dust from previously broken pieces of pottery to the new clay. This type of clay of this type of dust is called grog. A good potter takes broken pieces of pottery and shatters them to make the grog most useful for adding it to the new clay. When shattered just right, the grog added to the new clay will enable the potter to form that clay mixture into a larger and stronger vessel than it could otherwise be. And it can go through fires much hotter, plus when glazed, these pieces end up having a much more beautiful and artistic look to them than they would have otherwise been. And then I read Isaiah 45 verse 9, and it says, Woe to those who quarrel with their maker, those who are nothing but potsherds among the potsherds on the ground. Does the clay say to the potter, What are you making? And does your work say the potter has no hands? I kept reading that verse from Isaiah and decided to dive a little deeper into the term potsherd. A potsherd is a broken piece of pottery. A broken potsherd can lie on the ground and be nothing more than a constant reminder of brokenness. It can also be made, it can also be used to continue to scrape us and hurt us even more when we grasp it in our own hands. Or the master potter can be entrusted to take that pot shirt, shatter it just right, and then use it to, into remolding us to make us stronger and even more beautiful. And that portion was from a book called Seeing Beautiful Again. But in Genesis 50 verse 20 it says, As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. I've had to learn that no matter what we go through in life, all the hurts, the things that have happened to us and the events that go on in the world, God is still good, both before things happened and afterwards. God never planned for things to happen, but I do believe that he allows them to happen for a reason a reason we might never know the side of eternity. I've been attending the School of Supernatural in Wyndham since September 21, something I've wanted to do for a very long time, but my timing was never the same as God's. God has been working in me, showing me that if I would trust him with the broken pieces of my life, he would remold me and he would use it for good. A common thread that is coming through as well is that he's wanting unconditional time. In Luke 10, we see Martha running around trying to do everything while Mary was sitting at Jesus' feet listening to every word he said. I don't need to strive or, or to please anyone, constantly being busy or being like Martha, although I haven't gotten that right yet. 
All he's asking of me is to make room for him and to simply be. God wants a friendship with me. He wants me to love him back unconditionally without me gaining anything in return. It's easy, so easy to pray and ask God for something and he's more than capable of giving it. But when we don't get it, we go back to our old ways and only come to him when we want something again. I'm guilty of that. I would ask God for things and sometimes he answered me, but other times he didn't. And it's during those times of not getting that I need to push through in prayer and to continue to seek him and build a friendship with him rather than stopping my pursuit of him when, he doesn't get, when it doesn't go my way. A quote from Chris Vallotton's book, Supernatural Ways of Royalty, says, I want to want him more than I want what he can do for me. I want to want him more. I want that friendship he wants with me, a relationship that goes both ways. He wants to listen to everything that's going on in my world, but he's wanting to tell me what's on his heart too. I don't need to perform or do anything amazing for him to love me, because he loves me no matter what I do. All he's asking is for me to sit at his feet as Mary did and draw close to him. Thank you. That was fantastic, wasn't it? That was fantastic. I'm sure Grace will be equally fantastic, so keep clapping and welcome Grace. So I think God's been speaking to me about how he's got a father heart for us. Um, so when I was two, my dad left, um, and that, yeah, was kind of like changed our dynamic in our family home. Um, and we all have different experiences of family. Some of them are like really positive and some are really negative. But God's been revealing to me how his family, even though it's messy, he had, um, he has intentional like dynamics for family that he's created. Um, and a verse that's been on my heart lately has been, Matthew 7, 7, ask and it will be given to you, seek and you will find, knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks find, finds, and the one who knocks it will be opened. Um, or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone, or asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Um... And I think that verse for me really reveals what, to God, a role of a father should be and therefore what that should be for me and how it's so easy to bring in our, um, like, humanly um, experiences into looking at the role of a father. Um, it also teaches me that um, God's always talking and he's always there and that um, even when things don't feel so great, He's still a good father. He's really present. Um, yeah, and he's sorry. Yeah. And I think something as well is that he's just been revealing to me how he gives good gifts, and actually, it's so easy to talk down on yourself about certain things. And I think he's just perfect, and he's got a purpose for all of our lives, and that he's just we can ask him for stuff, and he's gonna. Um, yeah. I did have something that I was going to say, but I feel like God's just spoken to me, so I'm going to go with that instead. Um, we're in the West. We're absolutely obsessed with perfection. We are just obsessed with this idea that you have to do something amazing, and I have to stand up here, and it has to be flawless, and it has to be perfect. And if it isn't, then that's bad which I think Grace is feeling right now, but I absolutely guarantee you that that wasn't because Grace was just being genuine. And I think that is, that is what we need to be for God. We don't have to be perfect. We have to be genuine. Um, um, so I'm, <laughs> I'm a very, I will give everything a go, but I will do everything badly first go. Um, <laughs> So during the pandemic, I was um, I was 
started to read. And one of the books I read was one that Mike Betts recommended, which was um, Richard Foster's The Celebration of Discipline. And one of the chapters in there was about fasting, um, which really intrigued me because in the Bible, we talk about fasting and we talk about prayer sort of side by side. And the church talks about prayer all the time. But it doesn't really, we don't really talk about fasting. So I was really intrigued by this and I was like, all right, I'm going to give fasting a go. Um, so the first time I tried it, I tried a 24 hour fast and it went horribly wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I, I was, I kind of decided that I was going to not cheat, but I was going to do it a little bit easier. So rather than just going 24 hours and missing breakfast, lunch and dinner, I was going to go from lunchtime to lunchtime so that I sort of missed two meals rather than three. Um, so I started with my last supper, so to speak, and I had a nice big pile of uh, macaroni cheese. <laughs> um, so that was half one. I was ready to go. And I started, and that was going well. And then, um, then the craving started. <laughs> and then, um, so it was getting worse and worse. And you know when you're hungry and just everything tiny feels massive? That kind of happened to me is you hear the crisps in the background and there's someone crunching and someone cooked popcorn in the, at work so you just smell popcorn going through and I'm like, this is bad. So I was having really, really bad cravings at this point and I was like, this is a, this is a real struggle. I'm really struggling here. Um, you know, the sort of struggle that, you know, someone can make a film about, you know, that sort of level and it was 3 p.m. So <laughs> I'd managed 90 minutes and I was uh, really struggling. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, okay, this isn't working. So I went and did some research. And the first thing that I found said, if you're going to do a fast for 24 hours, do not have a heavy carb meal <laughs> because the cravings will drive you mad. So, um, so I thought about it. I went back to the plan and I then had a chicken salad and went through and done a 24 hour fast. And I had a, I had a prayer walk, which I really struggle with prayer, and that's something that God's also put on my heart. I don't know. I think, again, it's that perfection thing. I really struggle. If if we're in a prayer meeting and I'm praying, I will either not pray or my prayer will be 30 seconds because I just overthink and panic and just go, there. <laughs> that is my prayer technique, and that is something that I need to work on. Um, but, yeah, I that is what God's talking to me about. I think there's this pursuit of perfection and I think sometimes I'm <laughs> if the pursuit of being a Christian is perfection then I'm in trouble <laughs> because I will do everything badly but I will give everything a go so that's what God's talking to me about I, 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 I love the honesty of that that um, <laughs> it's so easy to get knocked off course isn't it and then to to worry about it but we don't need to do we? Beth. Okay uh, mine seems epically long now. <laughs> um, so I'm Bev and God is speaking to me about his timing um, and I'm just going to read off the sheet. Um, I've been on quite a journey with timing over the last few years so we're going to start in the middle mainly because I'm not sure where the beginning is and also because we're quite limited on time. Um, there was a prophetic evening for the pastoral team at the end of 2020 and when it was my turn all of the words that people had for me were along the theme of blossoming blooming a time to share and a time to come forward like a bird coming out in flower or a swan rocking up in glorious white feathers the problem with all of that blossoming and unfurling is that you're coming from a place of hiding of darkness or of being crushed I recently heard an example of this season in a book called Fight to Flourish. And make no mistake, it's a fight to flourish. Especially when it's sometimes a struggle to keep putting one foot in front of the other. Anyway, in the book she likens God to a gardener with a seed packet. And I know we've all heard about gardeners and seeds and mustard seeds and trees and all sorts of other horticultural things. But here's the thing that God spoke to me about. God's seed packet isn't a brown paper bag bag he can see the picture on the front of the packet he can see now what you'll be in all your glory 
Seeds need to be planted, though. They need to go into the dark, and it takes time. Sitting in the dark dirt, it's hard to imagine you'll ever be anything else. And to be honest, even in your wildest dreams, you can't imagine what's on the front of your packet. We see the darkness, and God sees us in the dark, but also in our shining moments to come. There's a trend on social media at the moment with a soundbite called Skip to the Good Part. In a beat, things go from mess to tidy, from wreck to renovated, from bump to baby, and there's no reality in that. I needed to get healthy, emotionally, physically, and spiritually. At that, I'm really sniffing, sorry. All I can hear is me sniffing down the microphone. Um... I needed to get healthy, emotionally, physically, and spiritually. At that point, I was holding on. God showed me that I need to stop seeking approval from people. And here's my first Bible verse. For they loved human praise more than the praise from God. There are a lot of examples of that in the Old Testament, and it never ends well. It's really hard, though, to not fully swing the other way and to start declaring that you don't care about other people, that you don't need anyone else especially if you're coming from a place of hurt, offence, or if you're feeling lonely and isolated. But God didn't make us to be alone. When he created Adam, he created Eve, because it wasn't good for man to be alone. So God put us all into lockdown so that he could spend some time with me. Books and scripture poured God's love into me. It was a season of healing and peace. I was blessed with God-sent friendships and a community group that reminded me that I could be a part of something that I could be honest and real, that I could be me and be loved. My heart, which bounded between broken and stone, began to soften. If you're hurting or lonely or struggling, find some people or be willing to walk with the people that God places in your path. However, we aren't called to just survive. We're called to live filled with faith and to change the world. It's a beautiful concept, but it's pull on your big boots time because just surviving is comfortable. Christine Kane says, it's hard to be fruitful when you're spending your life competing with others. It's hard to be fruitful when you constantly compare your life with someone else's. It's hard to be fruitful when you do not put your hand to the plow because you don't like the one you have. It's hard to be fruitful if you're complaining, cynical, or discontent. The only way to live the life and purpose God has for you is to actually start living your life. Today is a good day to stop wishing for another life, begin living your life. If you're faithful with what God has placed in your hands now, God will be able to trust you with what's in your heart later. Trust him, he's faithful. So that's the next bit then, trust him, take a step. I've learned to cling on to God in scripture when things get dark and this season has been no exception. Here are just a few scriptures that God's given me over the last few months as I thought about the fight to flourish and the next steps. The first one might not actually be a scripture because now I can't find it in the Bible. <laughs> but it's true. Um, the one who believes in him will be unshakable. <laughs> Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, I will help you. I will hold on to you with my righteous hand. Isaiah 41 verse 10. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but one of power, love, and sound judgment. 2 Timothy 1 verse 7. Do not be afraid, for the battle is not yours, but God's. The Lord is my light and my salvation, whom should I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life, whom should I dread? So I started this year feeling like that patient that's feeling better but still has to quarantine, something we all know a little bit about at the moment. It felt like I was in a holding pattern. Like I've done the stuff, let's get to the good part. But here we get more things about God's timing, God's lessons. First up, we never seem to be done. I've learned that I have to keep going back over things that can trip me up and deal with them again. Past offence I thought was gone rears its head. And if we're not ready to deal with these things, we go back down well-worn paths. I need to remember who the enemy is, and it's always the force that's driving the stick, not whatever it is you can see with your eyes that you're so focused on. I'm learning and learning again, and I'm waiting and waiting some more. I'm clinging on, I'm digging in, and I'm pressing forwards. 
We know that God has a plan and a purpose, and we want to skip straight to the good part. But we need to walk through the season we're in. We need to build good foundations. We need to get good at what he's put in our hands before we can hold the next thing. Another quote from Christine Kane. If God brought you to it, God will bring you through it. God will fill you with the strength you need to complete each and everything he's called you to do. But it's not going to come without some endurance. Spiritual strength is not built by doing things that come easily to you, but by overcoming the things you did not think you could. I always thought that to be faith-filled, it meant that I could leap without fear. And I was all in like that. I still am. I've had to learn that being faith-filled sometimes means being still, waiting. Sometimes in the dirt and the dark. God's teaching me that flourishing in him isn't a shallow, pretty thing that appeals to the masses on Instagram. Flourishing is tough and sweaty work that doesn't give up or give in. So I'm going to keep moving forwards and fighting and being still or leaping and trusting that God knows who I am and who he made me to be. God knows my heart and my dreams and my skills and my talents. God knows my backstory and about all my baggage. He knows where I'll flourish and be fruitful so that my life can be what's on the front of the seed packet and not just a brown paper bag that the enemy would like to keep me in. God wants to keep reminding me of all his truth and promises and I'm going to learn to be brave again. I'm going to remember how to be bold, to be a little bit crazy or a little bit assertive. I'm going to learn who God wants me to be and I'm going to be okay with the fact that it might take a really long time to get there. But I'm thankful that God found me and that he won't ever let me go. We're called to finish well, to finish brighter and so often I can feel pressured that to be a better me I need to reinvent myself but we don't need to flourish into something new. We're growing into who we are already. I don't need to find or be a better version of me. I just need to be the me that God created. Jenny Lusco says, God intends for you to become the most fruitful, most vibrant and most like Jesus version of you that you were born to be. If you can lean in, embrace the challenge and fight through the hard things, you'll start seeing the joy and the heartache. God is strengthening and using you more than it may seem. Keep going. Finally, <laughs> um, I just want to talk about church in all of this because God's been teaching me how important his church is. Holly Furtick wrote something recently about birds and how they fly in formation and she likened it to the body of Christ. That a bird can fly alone, but that in formation those same birds can fly further and faster. That alone we can get tired and lose direction, but together we can be powerful. We need people ahead of us, people who we can get caught up with, that can inspire us and call us on or call us out. And in a church family we've got people that are getting caught up in the wind that our wings make. None of us are spectators. If we flap our wings, if we get into formation together, the body of Christ can be a beautiful and powerful thing. It's countercultural to say that we're not buying into individualism, but that we're signing up to interdependent relationships. After a couple of years of isolation, after an offence or a hurt, after a fallout, it's really hard to place yourself willingly into the church family and to risk vulnerability. But we're called to surrender to God. We're called to give up our preference for the sake of others. My life is richer and more beautiful today because of relationships I have here. They weren't easy wins or obvious paths. I had to risk putting myself out there. And good godly relationships take time. Darlene Zetch says, <laughs> We will get hurt and we will hurt in return. That's part of facing grace. Our greatest wounds come from relationships, but so do our he deepest healing. The risk is worth it. When I'm flourishing in God, he gets the glory. I'm part of the victory. If I listen to the whisper that might say that I'm not good enough, or I don't have a place, or I'm not worth it, then the enemy takes me out of the game. If I'm not part of the church family, if I listen to the whisper that I don't belong, and that I'm not enough, that I don't need it, the enemy is the only one cheering. And I agree with Darlene, the risk is worth it, because flourishing is better than just surviving. <laughs>